Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a great clap. He's our coming king. We honor you, Lord. We welcome you, Lord. We open our heart to you. We celebrate you. We give you the honor. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you just lift your hands? Just close your eyes, lift your hands. Holy Spirit, come. We need revelation to our heart. And you're the one who gives revelation. You light up our understanding so we see things we've never seen before. I thank you, Lord, for the meeting we were in where you opened our eyes to understand the kingdom. And I ask, Lord, you'd open the eyes of people here to move away from just ungodly concepts of what church and Christianity is and into a revelation of your kingdom and its power and glory and its amazing King. Jesus, we honour you. So I can feel his presence here now. Jesus taught us to pray. Father, we honour you. Your kingdom come. Lord, give us understanding what that could mean for us and grace to be part of it. Amen. I'm just so enjoying the presence now. I know every time we teach and minister around the kingdom, there's always something special of God's presence comes. Amen. Please be seated. I want to welcome those who are watching online. We're so glad to have you here. And uh, everyone who's here, well, I'm praying that you're going to really get touched by today. And I've got the privilege of speaking for two sessions on this topic. And uh, I'm believing we're going to really have our eyes open. So I've been trying to work out where to go. There's so many things to preach and share on. But um, last week, Pastor Dave was talking about vision. And vision, the capacity to see beyond what is here and see something further for the future. Without vision, you don't focus your life and your resources. Without vision, you live carelessly and opportunity and time goes by and you miss the chance to do something significant. Vision is really important. And uh, we need not just vision for our family and our finances and the church and what we'll do. We do need to have the eyes of our heart opened up to vision for God's purpose. And Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, he said, I pray that the spirit of revelation, wisdom and revelation would come upon you and that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened and that you would know something you don't know. In other words, you can't know these things unless the Spirit of God comes on you to help you. That you might know the hope of your calling. If I asked you what your calling is, how many could describe it? Very few. Because there's no revelation. And the next thing he says to the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, you might know what is the greatness or the riches of his inheritance in the saints. And thirdly, the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Three things. Why don't you read Ephesians 1? Have a look at them and start to make them your prayer. I pray that prayer almost daily because I know I'm limited in understanding and need the spirit of revelation. So I'm going to do a series on the kingdom of God. We'll just see I'm away in Argentina in the middle of March, involved in a pastor's conference and crusades. And I've got two Sundays, and I'll preach this message, particular message, in two parts. And the message is called, What is the Kingdom? What is the Kingdom of God? And we're going to cover a few things you already know, but I want to expand it, because often we are quite limited. We have a little view. And... uh, I want to share it in two parts, the 12 characteristics of the kingdom of God. I think probably other people come up with other things, but these ones I think you'll readily recognize when we get into them. Amen? And it'd be great if you had a Bible and could go and have a look at the Bible as we go through. So 
uh, when, we, when we look at Jesus, Jesus' purpose was the kingdom of God. If you have a look right through the whole of his ministry, look at this. Uh, why did he come? So if I ask, why did Jesus come? Well, people got lots of ideas why he came. And, uh, but the Bible tells us exactly why he came. Here it is here in 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose is the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In other words, there is another invisible kingdom. It's a kingdom that the devil rules over. And Jesus has come to destroy its works, poverty and destruction and, and bitterness and hate, all those sort of things. Here's another one, Luke 19, 10. I've come to seek and save that which is lost. So what was lost? What was it that was lost that Jesus came to restore? Now, was it the earth? No, because the earth belongs to God. It's always belonged to God. It was never given to man. Something else was given to man that man lost. And uh, so in, in Psalm 24 verse 1, it says, the whole earth, or the, all of the earth, belongs to the Lord. Every part of the earth, everything. He created it. He owns it. He never gave the earth to man. What he gave to man was the privilege of being his representative and advancing the kingdom of God in the earth. That's what was given. He was given dominion. We see that in Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man, you visit him. You've made him a little lower the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor and created him for dominion over all the works of your hands. So what was given to man was a capacity as a spirit being in the image of God having access to all the resources of God to be able to create and steward the world. And the power that Adam had was far beyond what you've seen. He had access to God's authority. He had access to the power of God. He could create with his words. He could cause things to happen through the spoken word just as Jesus did. And you see, we have fallen so far we don't get what we fell from. We fell from dominion. And when we fell from dominion, when Adam surrendered, when he had one rule in this kingdom to keep, don't eat the fruit of that tree. And when he ate the fruit of that tree, he was actually rebelling against the king. And in doing so, he surrendered the right of dominion to the devil. And the devil said that to Jesus. He said in Luke chapter 4, he said, here's the kingdom of the world. I give them all to you. It's my right and privilege to give them to you. They were handed over to me or betrayed to me. So now when we look at Jesus' ministry, what Jesus came to do was to restore the dominion that man lost. So it's not just to get you to heaven. If that's what you think that Jesus came to get you to heaven, why would you think that when he made you for the earth? Did God change his plan somewhere along the line? He never changed the plan. He just outworking the plan. So if your vision is getting to heaven, you actually don't understand the purpose and plan of God. And you miss your opportunities on this earth to prepare and participate in extending his kingdom. Really important that we catch hold of these things. So when we look at Jesus' ministry, think about how he began his ministry. In, uh, for example, in Matthew 3, 2, he begins his ministry. What's his first message? Repent. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, Jesus' primary message was there's a kingdom. The dominion of God is again near you and available for you should you choose it. And to choose it requires you repent or have a change in the way you think and acknowledge and become part of this kingdom, this dominion of God. When man lost the dominion of God, that's when sin and sickness and cursing and death, all of these things, destruction came in. I remember just yesterday I was walking in my prayer walk just down by the railway line there. There's a long path there. And seeing the weeds there, I thought, all of that is because Adam gave up his dominion. And when the dominion's restored, the curse will be lifted, the earth will flourish. See, the Bible teaches on these things. So we've got to learn and, and expand in our thinking and understanding of what God is on about so we can participate in that. 
Think about Jesus' ministry. All through his ministry, his preaching was on the kingdom. Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what he's doing in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he's laying out the culture and constitution of the kingdom. Kingdoms have a constitution. Kingdoms have a culture. We'll get to that in a moment. I'm going to, before I finish today, give you a list of the 12 things I've identified uh, clear characteristics of the kingdom of God that we need some understanding about. So he's preaching. Here's the characteristics of this invisible kingdom. He said, and he gives, begins to describe them. All these different characteristics. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. In other words, meekness. We'll get onto that in another session sometime. Uh, Jesus also taught, you remember, he taught a lot of parables. What is the parables all about? Go read them. Go back and go through the Gospel of Matthew, which is the Gospel of the Kingdom, but go through the Gospel of Matthew and start to look at all the parables again. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower sow to seed. Kingdom of heaven is like a sower sow to seed. And then while he, was, uh, while he slept, uh, his enemy came and sowed tears. I mean, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who went to a far country and left his uh, servants, called his servants to himself and gave to them talents. It's over and over and over. And over. It's just evident there when you start to look at the Bible again from the point of view of kingdom, you'll see it everywhere. But do you understand what the kingdom is or how to align your life so you live in the full benefits of the kingdom? Yesterday, I was over in Napier and I drove past a council house. You know, a double little unit there and weatherboard and tile roof and, you know, pretty well historic. Back in the 50s and 60s, they were erected. It's where I was raised. And I, I thank God that because I've come into his kingdom, everything about my life has shifted. Yeah. I, almost, I should have taken a picture of it. Just that's where I came from. You understand? That's where I've come from. And everything about my life has changed because the gospel of the kingdom entered my life. You think about Jesus teaching on prayer. He taught to pray, how to pray. Here's how you pray. Go through it and read it again, Matthew chapter six. Don't repeat lots of things. He said, this is how you pray. Our, this is collective. We're part of something bigger than ourselves. Our father, he lives and is enthroned in heaven where you rule over all of creation. We honor your name and who you are. So he taught us that the first way you pray is you come to your Father who's also over all things and honor him. And then he says, now pray your kingdom come. May your will, your rule be established in the earth. Can you so everywhere you look, you're gonna keep seeing the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And once you've seen it in the New Testament, then start to look for it in the Old Testament and you'll see there's a progressive pattern there. Think about Jesus' miracles. When Jesus did a miracle, what are the miracles about? The miracle is a sign. What is it a sign? A sign points to something. So you see a sign, flax mare, hey, you, know, you don't stand there looking at the sign, admiring the sign. You know, it's pointing to something down the road. You understand? If you see signs, they point to it. So the signs and wonders and miracles all pointed of the reality of the kingdom of God and its total superiority over natural laws. Everything Jesus did in his miracles demonstrated that the kingdom of heaven is a more powerful, greater kingdom and it overcomes and overrides the laws of nature because the natural world came from that kingdom. In Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sickness and disease among the people. After Jesus rose from the dead, what did he do for 40 days and 40 nights? Well, he sat around having a meal and chatting and laughing and saying, man, we beat those guys. No, he didn't do that. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, he spent 40 days and nights teaching about the kingdom of God. See, looking through Jesus' ministry, this is his number one priority. This is the focus of what he said and did. But if we ask Christians about the kingdom of God, they, they barely are familiar with the parables, let alone the concept of what Jesus is talking about. And if you, if you don't have understanding of it, you can't live to the capacity of God's potential for you. 
you're going to live down according to your understanding. If you don't know how to generate wealth, you just work getting by every week because you don't understand how you have resources entrusted to you to grow them. You see, some of these things, when we get into them, we're gonna, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna push your head around a little bit. You think about Jesus teaching on priorities. What did he say is your first priority in life? First priority, seek first. Seek, it's a pursuing. Pursue first, what? The kingdom of God. But what is that? Seek first. So in other words, now, now he's, the context he's talking about is everyone around you is anxious and uptight. How many have noticed that? People are uptight, they're stressed out, they're taking medications, they're on anxiety pills, all that kind of stuff. He said, listen, he said, don't be like them. They're anxious about what they're gonna eat and drink and do and how tomorrow's gonna do. He said, but you seek first, prioritize your life around the kingdom, the rule, the dominion of God and His righteousness, the standards of His kingdom and everything you need will flow into your life because the King, and you'll see why shortly, will be providing for you. Yeah. Oh, come on, that's, that's a powerful way to live. I don't wanna live stressed out. And Jesus not only taught it, He lived it out. When He's in the garden, He's facing death on the cross. He said, Father, in Luke 24, he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, he lived out what he taught. This is what he came to do, restore the dominion that was lost by man back to man. So, okay then, so let's then talk about the kingdom. I'm just gonna get into the characteristics in a moment. I wanna just open up a few more thoughts about it. So the, here's, the, here's the first, next thing I want you to see. What is this kingdom of God? When you got saved, what happened? So if I ask you, what does it mean to be saved? Well, people come up with all kinds of things. Well, I've got my sins forgiven. Yep, why? What is the purpose of that? Well, I got healed. Well, okay, why? What is the purpose of that? I got delivered from some demons. Well, what is the purpose of that? Well, I got to live a better life. Well, what is the purpose of all of that? You understand, you've got to look past superficial and think a little deeper. The Bible says when you were saved in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, and it tells us this, he has delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated or transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now, a lot in that. Go and memorize the verse and go study it and think about and meditate on what it means. When you got saved, you were rescued from an evil kingdom. He rescued you. That word delivered means he saved and rescued you from something that had hold of you. You couldn't break it no matter how much you tried. You were rescued from what? From the power of darkness. The word power is exousia, a delegated authority, the rule of an invisible spiritual kingdom over your life. Every person born into this world is under the influence of a spiritual kingdom, spiritual forces that are invisible, they're evil, they're malevolent, they're behind wars, destructions, poverty, and death. The earth has got plenty to feed everyone. There's no lack. The problem is the governmental systems that exploit the resources and the people. And behind them are invisible powers. Our warfare is not with people, it's against invisible spiritual powers. You were, when you gave your life to Christ, what did you do when you gave your life to Christ? You acknowledged a king died to save you. A king, not just anyone, a king, your king, died on a cross to break the power and hold that another king had over your life through sin to free you from being afraid of death and to bring you into another kingdom. The first kingdom's called the kingdom of darkness because it is a dark, secretive, covered, deceptive place. And he brings us into another kingdom. It's called the kingdom of the son of his light, of his love. In other words, the kingdom we're brought into is the kingdom in which Jesus Christ is king. He didn't even name who the other one was, but we know him now. He's Satan, Lucifer, a fallen angel. 
He rules over a kingdom, a powerful kingdom. He is behind what goes on in finances, wars, even in the pop media. So much of it, He is behind it. Influencing, influencing to capture people. But we're translated into another kingdom where legal right, we are shifted from one, put into another. We become part of a kingdom characterised by love and by family. Kingdom of the Son of His love. Just as God loved Jesus, He loves you when you respond to Jesus. So we're put into another kingdom. Now, here's the thing. You were in another kingdom and that's how you learned to live. Now you're translated into the kingdom of God. You've got to learn what that is and what it means and how to live in it. You, you can't just come as a foreigner to another country and then just do whatever you think, what you got used to in the country you came from. You're gonna be arrested very quickly because you've broken the laws. You're gonna learn the laws and the realm of the new kingdom. So we have difficulty in understanding kingdom. Yes, perhaps you come from Tonga, then you'll have a better idea of kingdom because Tonga is a kingdom. So therefore you can't go in and buy any land there because the king owns it. And you're gonna say that's foreign to us because we're Kiwis live in New Zealand, go down and buy land if it's for sale. So a kingdom is very different to what we live in. But we are born into a kingdom and then we keep living the way we used to live, not realising you've got to change your whole, everything about your life has got to be upgraded. We need kingdom upgrade, it's called revelation. So we have struggle coping or understanding the kingdom of God because we're used to something different. We're used to an earthly Governmental system, we're interested, we're, we, we understand a democratic system where people are elected and I get to choose, I get to have a say in whatever and the democratic system uh, governs the whole culture. The problem with the democratic system is very simple. If the culture, if the character of the people decline, then the government becomes more empowered and take over more control and the people become more into bondage. So the whole thing for democracy to work is that people have a good character. Hello? That's what's going on right now. So lots of people are living off the government or living actually off other people who are hardworking because their character declined. You see, you, once you get into the thing of kingdom, you look at everything different. You'll see everything different. You'll understand what's going on. Some people have come from a tribal culture and governmental system. Now, if you come from a tribal governmental culture, then you do understand a little bit about a ruler and a king and about a governmental system. But most of the kingdoms uh, in this world have actually become a mixture. The, the king is only sort of like a, an, a leader by title. He has an honorary position. It's actually an elected government runs it. It's a mixture of kingdom and, and democracy. But the kingdom of heaven is not a mixture. Right. Kingdom of heaven is a kingdom. You've got a king, you're either on side with him or you're offside. If you're offside, it won't go well. It's kind of, once you see it, so, so, or, so a kingdom is completely the opposite of a, of, a, of a democracy because the center of the kingdom is the king. So a lot of people today are caught up with socialism. I encourage you, if, that, if, you're, if you're impressed by socialism, study its history. No people have prospered under socialism. Anywhere in history, they became ruled by tyrants who impoverished them. God's patent is a kingdom. Not a democracy. So when you get all caught up in the national government, and the national and labor and all these things, listen, none of them can solve the country's problems. Because at the core of the problems, they're spiritual. You can get caught up with all sorts of things, but you've got to actually engage the kingdom and understand it. So there's only about 10 kingdoms left in the world now. Netherlands and Spain and Denmark and I mentioned Tonga and Bhutan, Jordan. They have a queen, a king. You go to Thailand, there's a king. You insult the king, you're in jail. Like we, I remember going there and they said, you go to the movies, if you don't stand up when they say God save the king, you go to jail. Stand up in the movies, respect the king. And that's kind of, oh, oh, oh. you know, we're in democracy. No, that's how a kingdom works. Stand in the presence of the king. And you, you understand that? See, we bring all this democratic culture into the church and into our life with God. It doesn't work. 
That's why for many people they get disheartened and leave. So, so today's world, it's quite typical that a king is just a symbolic ruler like we have with the House of Windsor. They're primarily a symbolic ruler. And so therefore there's an elected government and there was some war behind that to make that happen. They killed the kings off for a while there until they come to a balance. We have a king and then we've also got a, a democratically elected government and, and so on. So New Zealand is a colony which is part of a kingdom. That's why we have a governor general. He's the representative of the king of England in New Zealand. So you understand that our origins we, as a country have come out of a kingdom. And unfortunately, the, the whole New Zealand culture is rooted in reaction against British class system and authority. So you find in New Zealand, there's, it's saturated with desire for social equality and independence. It's in the culture. Everyone wants it. Where, where did that all come from? Well, some of it's come from the fall and some of it's come, historically, there's been a massive reaction against the monarchy, against the class system, against all of that kind of things. We, we react against it. And we carry all those reactions into our walk with God. And so that reaction against kingdom, monarchy, uh, authority, class structure, anything like that, all of that shows itself up as the tall poppy syndrome. We've seen the tall poppy syndrome. Someone gets their head up and succeeds in life. Who do they think they are? That actually shows you don't understand honour. You don't understand the kingdom. Tall poppy syndrome is an evidence you're still living in another kingdom. Uh, another, familiarity is another one. Mate, mate, call everyone mate. I saw a classic clip. It has got to be the best I've seen in a while. Winston Peters. Well, you may like him or not like him, but there's some things about him I really like. And so this interviewer is coming, and the interviewer is interviewing about whatever they were interviewing about. They didn't even talk about that. And he called him mate. He said, wait a minute, I'm not your mate. He said, don't call me mate. I am not your mate. Don't approach me calling me your mate if you want this interview to carry on. And then he, once he established clearly, I will not let you be familiar with me. I'm a government minister, government minister, not your mate. In other words, he stood in his office and he put the guy in his place for his familiarity and disrespect for a government official. Then he proceeded to tell him how all the press had been sold out, been all bought. I thought it was great. Well, I loved it all. It was really great. Anyway, so those, those are the little things. I'm, just, I'm trying to get you just a few practical things so you see that this whole area of lack of understanding of kingdom comes right through the whole culture. And so uh, typically in New Zealand culture, there's reaction to all forms of authority or being given any directives what to do. Well, if you react every time someone tells you what to do, however you're going to live in a kingdom with a king. He doesn't explain why he tells you what to do. He just tells you what to do. And later on, he explains a lot more. But when you start off and walking in the kingdom of God, he just tells you to do this. You just either do it and get blessed or you don't. Well, you, either way. So, so, so passive rebellion is also an aspect of the, of the New Zealand culture that's contrary to the kingdom. I'll do it my way. Yeah. Really? How's that working for you? Yeah, you know, God's got his way of doing things. We need to know the ways of God. Well, I got my way. Oh, how's that going? And good for you, you know? And, and you work that out, but actually, I want to enjoy the full blessing, endorsement, and favor of my king. So I'm going to do the things that please him and not just do my own thing. You understand then? Living in a kingdom is really quite different. Okay. What's a kingdom then? Well, a kingdom really is, is, a, is a realm uh, or a territory over which a king rules. So primarily, a king, the kingdom is about a king ruling, he is in charge. He has the last word. No negotiations. He has the last word. And so that's the whole thing. So a kingdom is about the rule of a king. It's also about a territory. We'll get to that in a moment. And so in, in the kingdom, the king has the final say. You don't argue with the king. Well, I agree. Too bad. It's like you don't get that space in a kingdom. And of course, even as I say that, I can feel, I don't like this. Because we want to have our say and do our thing, and we struggle to acknowledge a king. That's the problem. And all the times as I share stuff, you, you'll find yourself, oh, don't like that. 
So, so the thing is that the king has total rule over all the people and all their affairs. You know, I don't like that. But here's the plus side. In return, the king has full responsibility to protect and provide for the people. So there's like a social contract. There's a covenant. We yield to the king and everything that we have is his. And in return, he guarantees to protect us and care for every need. That's why if you seek first the kingdom of God, you live without anxiety because you've got a king will provide for your needs. But if you don't understand, that's how a kingdom works. There's actually an agreement between the king and the citizens. You give whatever to him, he in return provides and protects. So you can live stress-free if you believe that. Of course, that's where faith comes in. I need to believe God is that good and we'll do that. You can't vote the king out. Oh, I ought to vote, I voted Jesus out. Yeah, well, they tried that once and he rose from the dead. It didn't work. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're doing it. It just doesn't work. I, you're getting it now. Okay. Then. So you can't. So, so a king holds his role until he either dies and God doesn't die. So he's in charge and he stays in charge. So you only get out by dying or by abdication. No other way. And God is eternal, so you're not going to die and he's not going to hand it all over. Okay. So the other thing that you need to understand about a kingdom, and this is a bit you may not like. We'll get back to it and, and we'll cover these things. The king owns everything. Oh, what about me? I own this and I own that. Really? Not in a kingdom you don't. And see, here's, see there's the problem. You look, growing up a democracy, well, I own this and I own that and this whatever. And, and what we want to do is we want to carry this life on into the kingdom of God. I want all the benefits, but I don't want to actually be responsible. You understand that they go hand. Oh, anyway, we'll outline it a little bit more. So, so Jesus, oh, there's the king. So, so Jesus taught about the kingdom in two ways. He said, first of all, it is here and now. The kingdom is here now, but it is invisible and it is spiritual. You can't see it, but it's real, very real. And he said, that kingdom will enter you when you receive its king like a seed into ground and produce a good fruit in your life. So when you receive Jesus, you are literally receiving the king and the what he has done for you, a seed, the spirit of God is sown in your heart. Now you are joined to your new king. You are empowered in a new life in this kingdom. Absolutely awesome, but it's invisible. People think you're just the same as you were before, but it grows. And so Jesus said that the kingdom is like a seed sown in your heart. And if you yield and nurture the seed, then the word of God will produce great fruit in your life. You need to study the Bible, read the Bible, learn the Bible, obey the Bible, follow what God has to say. Let the word get in your heart. You want good fruit? Plant good seed. You can't just keep feeding the weeds of your old life. Okay, you know, and, and, he, and, and that invisible kingdom can also come upon people in the form of miracles. So healings and deliverances, you look and you see some, I mean, I, I still marvel at deliverance. I mean, I stood in front of people and I stand talking, next thing you know, there's something inside them going, I know, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think, whoa. What is happening here? When you're looking at it from outside, you're like, what did he just do to him? That's why I try to not put my hands on people when I'm in that flow of ministry because I know the camera's watching. Some like, what did he do to him? I know he did something, they fell over. No, I didn't do anything. Well, I was actually a channel for the kingdom to manifest. And so when deliverance, Jesus taught, is the kingdom of God being demonstrated that it's there, it's real, and demons are real, and this whole thing is really real. So you don't want to hide it in the back room. Let it happen. If you've got demons, let them come up and manifest, and let's sort it out and get you fixed up, because that's what the kingdom does. So the kingdom of heaven is about a realm far beyond the natural realm that actually changes the natural realm. So as you live as a, in the kingdom of God, it's expected your whole life would change. So, so firstly, he taught it, the kingdom is here now. Secondly, Jesus taught it as the kingdom is yet to come. It is yet to come. This is what he, uh, we see, there's promises in the Old and the New Testament. That, and this is the thing that the Bible tells us our great hope. So in the Old Testament, there were three feasts. Passover, we're celebrating that soon. Ta uh, um, this Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles. Each one is for an experience. Number one, to get saved. 
They got saved out of Egypt. That's Passover, saved by the blood. An encounter with Jesus to save us. Number two, Pentecost, Feast of First Fruits. And in that feast, we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So there it is, two foundational things for all believers. Get saved, give your life to Jesus, get filled with the Holy Spirit. Then the third one, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Harvest in the seventh month, is a reminder Jesus will return for a harvest of the earth. So we are to remember, he will come back. And don't be like those who say, well, I don't know, maybe one day, whatever. No, no, we're to live to those who look for him shall he appear the second time without sin for salvation. So there's promises, like here it is in Daniel 2, 44. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms and shall stand forever. That's the kingdom. Have we seen that? No. Is it gonna happen? Yes. When? We don't know. All you can do is look for signs. And I get the opportunity, I wanna show you then how there are so many things operating now in the world that you, you, if, you, if you don't connect them, you can't see they're all pointing to Christ coming soon. Okay. Okay, so in the New Testament, in Matthew 6, 27, Jesus said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and angels and reward everyone according to his works. So the promise that Jesus will return and will establish his kingdom physically on the earth for a thousand years is the hope of every Christian. So what will happen when he returns? Well, there's a whole lot in the Bible about that. What will life be like for a thousand years when he's ruling, when there's no more angry, warring governments, when war has ceased, when peace has come and now the curse is lifted, there will be prosperity like has never been seen before. The earth will enjoy the most amazing experience when the kingdom of heaven is being manifest in the earth. There'll be people living and dying and growing and having children and marrying. All these things will be happening. Now, we've got no time to go into all of the things, but the Bible's full of things about this coming kingdom and what it'll be like. We're to prepare for it. If you have that hope, then you purify yourself, the Bible says. You actually walk clean because you're wanting to be part of that. Okay. Right, so now here we go. I want to just, if I get a little bit more time, I might do a bit more, but I want to give you what I've identified are 12 key characteristics of the kingdom of God. 12 key characteristics. And then we'll open them up and speak on them a little bit uh, and open up each one just a little bit so you understand more about the kingdom you're in. Okay, here's what they are. I'll just list them for you because some only get to this session and want to hear it all and go and have a look for yourself and sort them out. Now, the kingdom, this is what... Now, you, you can tell these characteristics by, firstly, you look at a natural kingdom, kingdom of Tonga, kingdom of Bataan, king of Jordan. You start to look at those kingdoms. You look at what they have naturally. And then you start to look into the word of God and see what the word of God says. And then you start to come up. Here's what kingdom of God has. Number one, a king who rules. The undisputed ruler over the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. You accept and respond and walk in his, uh, uh, in his kingdom or you rebel. It's only, that's the only kind of choices you have, really. And here's the thing, that in a kingdom, the kingdom takes on the character of the king. So, our King Jesus gave his life up because he loves us and he gave his life in sacrificial service. That's our King. I can trust that King with everything. And if I will yield to that King, his kingdom is a kingdom full, the Bible says, of peace, right, righteousness, peace, and joy the Holy Spirit gives. So whenever God is ruling in your life, peace, righteousness, peace, and joy will be characteristics of your life. When the kingdom is not ruling, then those things will vanish. Quite simple. Okay, not, but, but a kingdom takes on the nature of the king. So the kingdom of the devil takes on his nature. And Jesus said he's a thief and a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So to live in the kingdom of the world under the culture of New Zealand or the world philosophy and beliefs is to come under a kingdom whose king is wanting to steal, kill, and destroy everything that's important in your life. The kingdom reflects the nature of the king. So in your marriage, your marriage will reflect how much 
of the kingdom of God is present in that relationship. Your family will reflect how much the, uh, the lifestyle of the kingdom has been built into your family. Oh, getting real quiet now. I'd like to do a series on that and what it means to be a kingdom man. What about king? Anyway, we'll go on. Here's the second thing in a kingdom. A kingdom it consists of a territory, uh, a physical territory, a realm of where the king rules. So if you, if you think about it, this realm of earth, while Jesus is king over it all, we don't yet see that. The Bible says we don't see it yet. Why don't we see it? Because another king and a rebellion is in the earth. So you are living in a kingdom full of rebellion, full of witchcraft, full of deception, full of deceit, greed, all kinds of things. And God is wanting you to be a representative living in that realm. So uh, it's always a territory. So the first territory that you must give to the king is your heart. When you give your heart to the Lord, what you're doing is you're surrendering who you are and your affections and desires and ambitions to the king. We surrender our spirit to him. We surrender every part of our life as we get renewed in the word. We surrender our mind and let the word of God shape how we view the world. Not the media. The media are paid off. The media reflect the prince of the power of the year. How can you watch it all and think that's real? It's actually a narrative representing the interests of the people who pay them all. As soon as you, as soon as you, if you can just get that, the, the true narrative is found in the Word of God. That's how you've got, well, you got to read the Word of God or the other stuff will actually program you. Okay, here's the third thing, citizens. Every kingdom has citizens. So you're not a member of a kingdom. I'm not a me- I'm not a member of New Zealand. I'm a New Zealand citizen. I've got a passport. I can go anywhere because I've got the passport. I can come and live here. I can come and work here. If you haven't got that, you can't. See, you, so you're not a member of a country. You're a citizen of a country. So we are citizens of the kingdom. A kingdom has citizens, and the citizens have responsibilities. And they also have enormous privileges. So when you come, say, to, to New Zealand, and you're a citizen of New Zealand, then there are benefits of being a citizen. All kinds of benefits. But if you're not a citizen, you don't have any of those. Because you're not a citizen. You're an alien. You don't belong there. You see, once you start to see these things clearly. So, so the kingdom of heaven, you're only part of the kingdom of heaven if you're a citizen. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, here's, a second, here's, a, here's a fourth thing. Every kingdom has a system of laws called a constitution of some kind. It has a legal system. And it has a court that punishes the offenders. The kingdom of heaven has a constitution and laws and it has a court system. Do you know about the court system? Difficult if you don't know about the court system because the devil knows about it and he's the prosecutor and accuser who accuses you all the time and if you don't understand the court system and how to get free, you're going to live condemned all the time. Are you living condemned all the time? Shamed all the time? Oh, you haven't understood the court system and how to actually get access to the privilege of being guilt-free and shame-free. Getting the idea? Kingdoms, it's got a system of laws. I mean, see, if it didn't have a system of laws, it would be lawless. So the kingdom of heaven has got laws and principles to govern it. Have you studied to find out what they are? Here's the thing about the principles of the kingdom of God, the way it operates. It doesn't operate like New Zealand does. It doesn't operate like the natural realm does. It operates completely differently. And so we need to understand that. We'll get into some of those as we go through the series of it. Okay, here's another thing it has. Uh, It has a culture. The kingdom of heaven has its own culture. And it has what we call standards or values. Did you know that? The standards of values of the kingdom are called righteousness. Well, I think I can just come to church and pay a little bit to God and praise a little bit and pray a little bit and read my Bible once in a while and just live and do whatever I like. Not so. If you want to get the blessings of the kingdom, the kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness. You've got to let your life become aligned. That's why Jesus said, seek first the rule of God 
surrender to his leadership in your life because he's a good loving king. And secondly, seek his righteousness. Seek how to conduct your life, the values and ways to treat people, to do life. Seek it. You're not just gonna come to you. You seek it. You seek humility and meekness. You seek wisdom and understanding. You seek purity and uprightness. You seek faithfulness and loyalty. They don't just turn up. You seek the things that enable you to be a productive, fruitful, honourable citizen of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has an education system. You think, well, I'm just going to go to heaven and play harps. Where did you get that from? And who wants to go and play harps all day? I'm not going to do that. Now, I got no interest in that whatsoever. None whatsoever. Why would you go to a place and you sit around in the clouds with white robes and play harps? Not, no, it's not for me, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm enjoy, I go fishing. I'll enjoy that better or go shooting. That'd be much happier. You understand? That's not what heaven is like. It's a place of learning, of growing, of developing. And so on earth, if you're a citizen of the kingdom, God expects you to learn and grow and develop. And he gives ways for that to happen. You need to understand God's education system. Every country, if it doesn't have an education system, does not raise up leaders. Oh, wow. Here's another thing it has. Kingdom of heaven has a financial system, an economic system. Every kingdom has an economy. And God's economy is always good because he's, he's a winner. He knows how to make it work. So there are ways of governing finances on earth that are aligned with the kingdom of heaven. So one of the things if you want to live in the kingdom is bring your financial understanding and all your ways of doing money and bring them before God and ask him to teach you the ways of the kingdom, how to grow wealth and become generous and able to give and bless others. It's mine. You see, that's right, there's the problem. You know, it's all mine. No, we'll see that in a moment. We'll, we'll get to that in the next session perhaps. Okay, here's another thing that a kingdom has. The kingdom has authority and power. And this is something that's very hard for, for people to grasp. That in the kingdom, there are ranks of responsibility and authority and power. And if you want to live in the kingdom of God, you must learn how to recognize authority that comes from God and on, position yourself right towards it. Our issue of being familiar with authority stops even Jesus could not do miracles where people were familiar with them. Now, I won't go into it all now, right now, but if you become familiar with someone God sent to bring blessing to your life, they cannot bring blessing to your life because you stopped the flow of what God gave them to bring to you. Whoa. That's a big problem. Even Jesus couldn't do anything. They just thought, wow, I know that guy. I saw him grow up. Man, well, we know his brothers and sisters here. Wow, wow. Who is he? Who do you think he is anyway? And, and so he could not do anything. Now you understand that when Jesus came into his hometown, he was not coming as Jesus, the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph and the brothers and sisters. He's coming as an anointed representative of the kingdom. Yes, he was all those other things, but he's not now. And you see, you've got to honor God's people that he sends to bring you enlargement to your life. And this thing of familiarity that's in New Zealand stops that happening. Big time. I'm not going to get sidetracked into that, but helps you understand that. So authority and power. Here's another. And so authority and power means the power to be able to do miracles, the power to be able to see God move supernaturally. God wants you to have that. Okay, let me give you the last couple. Here's the next one, number nine. Uh, God, in, in a kingdom, every kingdom has ambassadors. You notice that? Every country has ambassadors. What is an ambassador? It's someone who speaks on behalf of the country and gives the king's policies. An ambassador didn't come and say, well, listen, well, the king's got some opinions here and he wrote them in the book, but look, I want to tell you what I think. That's not how an ambassador works. 
An ambassador is a representative. So in the kingdom of God, every ambassador is a child of their father who's the king. And every ambassador is a representative of the kingdom. You and I are called to be ambassadors of the kingdom. So here's the thing. I'm a citizen of two kingdoms. I'm a citizen of New Zealand, but I'm also a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and an ambassador for heaven. And that takes priority over this. Now, I'm going to have to get and teach that next week. But you've got to understand you belong in two kingdoms. One's a natural physical one. It's got its passports and its laws and whatever. But there's another one, which is a higher one. And that will always be the focus of your decision making. You are primarily a representative of the kingdom of God everywhere you go. Get any idea? Well, okay. Here's another thing most countries have. You notice countries have armies? So why do they have an army? Why does a country have an army? Well, it has an army to protect itself. Why does it need an army to protect itself? Because it's enemies. Does God have an army? Yes, he does. Jesus is called the captain of the hosts, the armies. So they're angelic armies, and they're organized as armies. They have a role and a function to do. So the kingdom of God has an army or a military force. Here's another two things. We'll just finish with this today. Uh, and and every, every kingdom has a border and entrance requirements. Think about that. Every kingdom has a border and has entrance requirements. In other words, you can't come in if you want to unless you meet the entrance requirements. Think about that. You can't come in. So if you get to the border, I remember I was traveling on a New Zealand passport. I had to get my passport renewed. And fortunately, unfortunately, they didn't bring it back in time. So I happened to have a second passport. Irish. Okay, have my second passport. I went, I said, listen, you guys didn't return my passport in time. I'm having to use the Irish passport. They got stamp away I went so I went through came out and then when I got I did a bit of a circuit came to Australia I got to Australia and I got to the and I said to board the plane and they said wait a minute this is Irish have you got a return ticket and I said no I live in New Zealand he said no 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 you need a return ticket they said no I live there I'm a citizen of New Zealand he said no you're traveling on an Irish passport if you don't have a return fare you can't even leave Australia and go to New Zealand he said but I belong there <laughs> I live there what are we going to do I rung up Joe said Joe help me and she said, I'll see if you've got another trip coming up with a flight out and I'll give you that flight. And, then, and I got that flight. I ran up at the last minute. Here, I got a flight out of New Zealand. I can get in. See? And then when I got there, they said, oh, Irish, where's your visa? I said, I, said, I live here. And they said, would you just go over and wait over there and someone will come over and see you. And I had the, the seat of shame where you, <laughs> where you sit over there and you don't really, you know that the, everyone who's coming through is looking at you. Drugs, yeah, look suspicious. <laughs> Send him back wherever he come from. <laughs> you understand? The issue is all about border requirements. Well, the Bible, Jesus said, he gave the border requirement. Unless you be born again, you can't see the end of the kingdom of God. You can't get in without being born again. You must receive the king. You must honour the king. Receive the king into your life. Bow to the king. And when you bow to the king, then citizenship is given. You're born into this kingdom. You can't get in any other way. There's no other way in. You've got to be born again. You must be born again. You must have a change spiritual where the Spirit of God comes in. Now, on a passport, it's got a stamp there and the Bible and that stamp, they look at it, they hold it up, look at it. Yeah, it's a genuine seal. He's a Kiwi. See? But in the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The only way you get into the kingdom of heaven is if the God looks at you and He looks past how nicely you're dressed and He looks and see the Holy Spirit in there. That's one of my citizens. One of my citizens. See? So there are border requirements to get into the kingdom. How about that? Border requirements. Well, we'll touch on the thing of borders a little bit later, but borders are really important. So heaven has walls around it apparently and it has gates. Why do you have walls around it? Stop people getting in. They don't, it's not that everyone wants to get out. Everyone's happy there. They just don't want to get, they don't want to let people in that don't qualify. Do you understand? It's very important. And I can't get into that today, but Jesus had a lot to say about entrance to the kingdom. Here's the last one I want to share. This one's classic. 
How many know Queen's Birthday Weekend? Or it's called King's Birthday Weekend now. Huh? And what do they do on King's Birthday Weekend? You know it because you never turned up on the list. What is it they do? They have the list of honours. Isn't that right? And so people who did service over the last year, the Queen or King as it is now, <clears throat> identifies and gives them honour for their service. Well, you, you're used to that. You've seen all of that. But did, did you not ever occur to you that this would be true of the Kingdom of God? That there would be honours and rewards for faithful serving citizens. Well, there are. Book of Revelation, first three chapters, full of them. Everyone who overcomes, this is the promise. Everyone who overcomes, this is the promise. Everyone who overcomes, this is the promise. My reward is with me to give every man according to his works. And the king went to a far country, called his servants, gave to himself talents. And then after he returned, he called them to himself, seeing how much they gained by training so he could honour them. You have to understand that in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, there is a system of rewards and honours which will not be revealed until the return of our King. And when He returns, hey, then everyone will know. You won't be able to hide. He knows what you've done. He knows every little thing you did, every act of kindness, every act of service, every selfless thing you did, every little sacrifice you make. He knows it all. He will call you forward and say, I want to reward you. Enter the joy of your King. See, so these are the 12 things that characterise the Kingdom of God. How about that? I want to, in the next session, open them up a little bit further and share a bit more. We'll see how far we can get with it. But at least I wanted you to have the list to see what they are. You're in a kingdom. It has a king. It has a territory, a realm over which the king rules. Every part of your life that the king rules and his word and his will are done, the king's kingdom is advancing. So there's a kingdom, there's a territory. There's also the citizenship and there's qualifications for being a citizen. And if I'm a citizen, I have rights and privileges. There's a financial system, a way to create wealth. There's an education system. There's an, uh, an education system to develop us. But if you can't receive the people God sends to you, you're gonna flunk out. Do you understand? This is not about being in church. This is about being part of a kingdom. Church, yeah, I'm a member. I think I'll go to another one. But you can't do that with the kingdom. You, you understand? You just can't do that. You're a citizen. So the only thing is, are you a good citizen or are you rebellious, independent, troublesome citizen? Are you a citizen that has the favour of the King over your life and His favour shows up in your finances, your marriage, your relationships, where you work, what you do? Or are you not walking in the favour of that King? Are you connected in a prayer relationship and the power of the Holy Spirit flows through you? When you pray, things seem to happen. Can you understand citizenship affects every part of our life. There's an army. Do you know how prayers can move the angelic realm? Do, do you understand there are borders and entrance requirements? I can give them to you and show you where to find them in the Scripture. I've searched for them to find what they are. And when Jesus comes in His kingdom with glory, a lot of people are going to get a shock because that's the time of rewards and honours. And not all at that time will be honoured because they have not lived an honourable life. What? See, one of the things the kingdom will do is it starts to bring the fear of God around your heart. Not a, uh, but rather a respect and a reverence. Why don't we just stand and lift our hands to our King? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you're living in a kingdom described as the power or authority of darkness. Lots of secrets, lots of hidden things, lots of bad things. Things you're ashamed of. You could make a decision to receive Jesus Christ. And if you made that decision today, prayed a prayer and made the first step of building that connection with Him by faith, 
your life changes, you become citizen of another kingdom. If you're here today and actually as you look at it, you have defaulted back to an old way of living, you're not bringing honour to the Lord You say, God, I want to repent and become aligned and seek your kingdom first. It'd be great for you to just come up and lift your hands or bow your head or kneel or whatever before the King. Why don't we just sing that song, Holy? We were singing it before. There's such a presence of God on it. As we lift our hands to Him, let's honour our King. Jesus, we give you the honour. You are King over all the kings of the earth. You are Lord over every Lord of the earth. Lord, we honour You. Lord, we bow the knee to You. We bow our heads to You in gratitude for Your sacrifice. You gave Your life up, sacrificed it, paid an excruciating price. We honour You, Lord. If you're here today and want to receive Jesus as Your King, Come, make your way to the front. If you want to return to the Lord today, if you want to come and repent, there's something you need to deal with, come, come, come now, come now. Don't hold back. If God spoke to you about an area of your life today, you say, God, my life is out of order in that area. I'm coming to you today. Please come, please come, please come now. Come now, make your way, make your way. Bow to your King. Lift your hands to your King in surrender. If you have need for healing, make your way to the front for your King to minister healing to one of His servants and sons. If you need freedom from oppression, make your way to the front. Lift your hands to Him. Believe God. If you can believe, the Kingdom of Heaven can become part of your life. Do you need a breakthrough? If you can believe, All things are possible to him who believes. Make your way to the front. Lift your hands to your King. Ask him for your miracle. Ask him for your breakthrough. If there's someone that you're believing God for, say, God, it's a family member. God, it's someone I care about. Lord, I'm coming to you as your citizen, a son, a daughter, and I lift my voice for your power to be released. Lord, I come to the throne of grace. I come to the seat of your government over all of creation. And I bow to you. Say, Lord, here I am. Is there anyone else? Come, 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 come. Don't hold back. If you need a fresh touch of God on your life, make your way to the front. Lift your hands and worship your King. If pride got a hold of your heart come and lift your hands humble yourself to your king if fear has got a hold of you anxiety has got a hold of you come seek first the kingdom of God don't be afraid or worry place God first again you're worthy worthy Lord
we honor you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just for this moment here, is there anyone come to give their life to Jesus? Okay, who's come to give their life to the Lord? Just you come near to me. Just come over line. Just right here in front of me. Just come and stand in front of me. I'd love to just lead you in a prayer. Anyone come forward to give their life to Jesus? Just come. Just come right to the front. Come right in the center here. Okay, God bless. Come right into the center here so I can see you. And let's give our life to Jesus. Hey, come on, let's give him a clap, church. Give him a clap, come on. Amen. God bless. God bless you, son. God bless you. It was some rededications. Okay, just follow me right now in prayer. Church, close your eyes. We close our eyes so we become less aware of what's around us. Then you allow yourself to just go into your spirit. This is where God meets with us in our heart and spirit. I want you just to follow me in this prayer. Jesus, I acknowledge you as king. I acknowledge you as my king. I ask you to forgive me for violating your laws. I come to you now. I believe you died on the cross to forgive me, save me, rescue me, and bring me into your kingdom. Jesus, I come to you. I receive your forgiveness and I stand again as a child of God and a citizen of your kingdom. I thank you, Lord. Lord, pour your presence over my life. Touch me with your presence right now. Thank you, Lord.